When it comes to the Vietnam War, the Chinese are often mentioned, yet mostly on the side. This is due to a lack of sources, language barriers and other issues. Additionally, Vietnam and China have conflicts of their own. As such, Vietnam has incentives to downplay the Chinese involvement. My personal impression is that China and Western perspective is mostly mentioned about why the US leadership did not expand the war in North Vietnam and or escalated the bombing campaigns. Luckily, I recently stumbled across a paper written by a Chinese scholar, which looks more into the perspective and actions of the Chinese during the Vietnam War. Now, first off, we need to take a short look at the Korean War. In the early 1950s, the United States and Communist China did not directly communicate with each other. This led to a major problem, since the Chinese wanted to make clear to the US that they would not allow for an invasion of North Korea by US or UN forces. As such, on September 1st, 1950, referring to North Korea, Mao Zedong publicly stated that China could not tolerate the invasion of a neighbor, a public signal in the press intended to deter the US and UN forces from going into the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Shortly afterwards, a second warning was passed via the Indian ambassador that the Chinese would not stand by the side if the US and United Nations forces marched into North Korea. Problem is, these warnings, however, were dismissed by the United States as unreliable or mere bluff. What followed was the Chinese sent um, about so-called volunteers, about a few hundred thousand into North Korea that inflicted losses on the US and UN forces and also drove them back more or less to the 30th parallel. So the line that separates North and South Korea nowadays. This incident was of course on the minds of the US and Chinese leadership during the whole of the Vietnam War. As such, we need to look at the strategic considerations by the Chinese leadership first. Now, Vietnam is located on the southern Chinese border. As such, it could also be seen as an entry point into China, or a staging ground for an invasion. Second, the Chinese believed that the United States, which in their view had failed in Korea and Taiwan in the 1950s, was now expanding the war against China into Vietnam. From the Chinese perspective, Beijing's support of Hanoi's war of national liberation would serve to break the ring of encirclement by US imperialism and thus increase the security of China. Mao Zedong assumed that the imperialists were planning for a war of aggression. As such, China was prepared for war. Furthermore, there were various incidents of US planes violating Chinese airspace, which did not in particular calm down the situation neither. Similarly, in the mid-1960s, Chinese leaders were concerned about a potential US invasion of China from Vietnam. Now, we need also to take a look at the bigger picture here. Although China was a communist country like the Soviet Union, the relationship between the two countries was not always the best. Generally, the Soviet Union at this time was more focused on a political coexistence with the West, and this was considered by the Chinese leadership as US imperialism. To put it simply, the Chinese leadership was not particularly relaxed neither toward the US nor towards the Soviets. Let us look at the ideological considerations next. The Chinese leadership in Beijing considered the North Vietnamese liberation, under quotation marks, of South Vietnam as a vital part of the revolutionary movement. It was also seen as a crucial defense for socialism against imperial attacks, since the fighting in Vietnam would tie down US forces that could not engage somewhere else, which of course is again linked to a regular strategic consideration as well. Ideologically, in the 1960s, overthrowing the US-dominated international order was seen as a requirement for the worldwide revolutionary struggle. So in another way, the Vietnamese fighting US forces in Vietnam was an important step for the global revolution in the eyes of the communist Chinese leadership. A related aspect to the strategic and ideological aspects are the personal aspects between the leadership of Vietnam and China. Although the problem here is it's kind of hard to verify and or to distinguish from the other points, but I 
I made a, a separate point on this. Now, North Vietnamese leaders frequently visit Beijing and converse with Chinese leaders about major developments of the war and other developments. The Chinese leadership was also very impressed by the Vietnamese willingness to fight against US forces. How much this has an influence is hard to say, yet it was Mao's view that China must provide whatever Hanoi needed for the war in the South. He carefully studied Hanoi's requests for aid from China and even ordered mosquito nets for all North Vietnamese soldiers because he thought that the hot and humid South of Vietnam must be infested with mosquitoes and ants. That is quite a bit of micromanagement and this brings us also to the next major point, namely the Chinese support for Vietnam. Although the terms of the 1954 Geneva Agreement did not allow the buildup of forces of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, aka North Vietnam, China provided arms and ammunition. Additionally, they even trained and equipped North Vietnamese soldiers. To give you a better understanding on the amount provided, China probably provided some three quarters of total military aid given to North Vietnam during the war. Vietnamese figures show that the Soviet Union provided a total of about half a million tons of military aid, including weapons, ammunition, equipment and supplies during the period of 1954 to 1975, while China provided nearly 1.6 million tons of military aid during the same period. However, the value of China's military aid probably represented only about one quarter of the total value of all military aid received by North Vietnam. Now this was for the period from 1954 to 1975, yet I have some more detailed numbers on equipment for the shorter duration of 1955 to 1963, so before Lyndon B. Johnson's escalation in Vietnam. In this time period China provided about 240,000 guns, 2,700 artillery pieces and 175 million rounds of ammunition. The author also notes that the North Vietnamese request often received the highest priority. He notes that between 1961 and 1972 the North Vietnamese received more howitzers and mortars than the Chinese People's Liberation Army. Furthermore, the Chinese version of the Soviet designed AK-47 automatic rifle, the famous Kalashnikov, which was manufactured in China after 1956 was provided to nearly all regular People's Army of Vietnam soldiers even before the People's Liberation Army soldiers had been equipped. Often when Hanoi's requests exceeded China's production capability, Beijing transferred arms and equipment directly from the People's Liberation Army to Hanoi's inventory. Additionally, this support was not only limited to military aid, it also included many projects. For instance, in 1965, there was an agreement to expand the transportation capacity of the rail lines that linked North Vietnam and China. Even in 1968, when China was not particularly happy about the negotiations going on between North Vietnam and the United States, it still provided weapons. And from 1970 to 1972, when US forces were withdrawing, China provided more than 300 tanks and 200 field guns with almost half a million artillery shells. Especially noteworthy in terms of the project is what these had on an influence on U the US bombing campaign Rolling Thunder. Because during this time the North Vietnamese asked for help with repairing the infrastructure. As a consequence between 1965 and 1969 the entire period of American Rolling Thunder air campaign a total of 320,000 Chinese troops served in North Vietnam. The greatest number in country at any one time was 170,000, equivalent to more than 10 divisions. More than 1,100 Chinese died and 4,300 were wounded in Vietnam, the vast majority by American airstrikes. Now these Chinese troops repaired hundreds of kilometers of damaged railroad tracks. Chinese railway engineering troops were not completely new to the task since they already had faced such problems in the Korean War. In many cases, although US bombing inflicted serious damage, the railway lines and facility could be made operational quickly again. North Vietnamese leaders later acknowledged that the bombing destroyed virtually all transportation and communication facilities built after 1954. However, US bombing failed to coerce Hanoi into suspending its support for the revolution in the South, and the presence of Chinese railway engineering troops 
significantly reduced the effects of the airstrikes. By February 1969, Chinese units had made 1,778 repairs, including 157 kilometers of railroad and 1,420 kilometers of telephone lines. This also undermined American plans that assumed that the extensive bombing campaign would prevent North Vietnam from relocating troops from the north to South Vietnam. Yet since the Chinese provided such extensive support, this freed up Vietnamese troops to be sent into South Vietnam. And this is of course closely linked to the military cooperation and troop movements by China. Because they sent troops as well. Following the Gulf of Tonkin incident in 1964, talks about military collaboration were initiated. Additionally, Chinese air power was increased in the border regions. This led to redeployment of various air force divisions and the construction and expansion of existing airfields and facilities in those regions. The most significant development was the deployment to North Vietnam on the 6th and 7th of August 1964 of a fighter regiment with 36 MiG. These aircraft were based at the newly built airfield at Phu Kien, 12 miles northwest of Hanoi. Since the Democratic Republic of Vietnam had no combat air force at the time, Washington believed that the mix were Chinese. Recently released Chinese sources indicate that these mix belonged to the Democratic Republic of Vietnam's 1st Fighter Regiment, which was organized in September 57 by China and trained in China. Similarly, in 1965, the Chinese also sent a large formation with about 20,000 personnel into Vietnam to help building up defenses on the northeast coast. This was likely in relation to the Korean War where the Chinese warnings were ignored or dismissed by the US leadership. So China wanted to be sure that the message this time was understood. A few months later, the North Vietnamese requested two anti-aircraft artillery divisions for the defense of North Vietnam. The next day, Beijing informed Hanoi that two anti-aircraft artillery divisions and one regiment would enter Vietnam immediately and take responsibility for defending two railroads between Hanoi and China. Now, if you look at these various and extensive forms of Chinese support for North Vietnam, it is obvious that this at least indirectly influenced the North Vietnamese strategy. Now, some Western studies argued that China never supported offensive actions against South Vietnam that went beyond guerrilla warfare. Yet, Xia Monging Zhang notes that the Chinese records were released that counter this assumption. According to these sources, Mao Zedong argued to Ho Chi Minh to go from guerrilla tactics to regular warfare with larger units. Yet it is not known if this had a direct influence on the North Vietnamese leadership or not. To summarize, the Chinese leadership had both strategic and ideological reasons to support North Vietnam. The strategic reasons were mostly defense related, since the Chinese leadership felt threatened to be encircled by US bases from Taiwan, Korea and potentially Vietnam. Additionally, once US troops were engaged in Vietnam, a potential threat was always that US forces would invade China from Vietnam. As the Chinese leadership had many reasons to support North Vietnam, and it did so excessively with about three quarters of all support received. Although its value was lower than that of the Soviet support, the Chinese also provided extensive manpower, especially engineers, but also troops for anti-aircraft defenses. This not only limited the US effects of bombing like rolling thunder, but also freed North Vietnamese troops to be sent into South Vietnam. As such, Hanoi's leaders might not have been completely satisfied with Beijing's support, but they acknowledged that Vietnam could not have succeeded without the vast rear of China and its support. A big thank you here to Ken for sending me the longest war from my Amazon wishlist. Also, thank you to Justin for helping me with further information. As always, sources are linked in the description. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you for watching and see you next time.